Assalamu alaikum dear brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I'd like to welcome you all to another session on the tafsir of Surah Ar-Rum which is the 30th chapter of the Holy Quran we've reached uh, verse number 22 so and uh, so we'll begin with that verse and inshallah we'll cover some of the uh, the verses after that so if you have a copy of the Quran and you'd like to follow along turn to verse Number 22 of Surah Ar-Rum. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa min ayatihi khalqu al-samawati wal-ard wa ikhtilafu al-sinatikum wa al-wanikum. Inna fi thalika la-ayatin lil-alimin. And among his signs are the creation of the heavens and the earth and the variation in your tongues and colors, truly in that are signs for those who know. Beginning with verse number 20 to 25, there is a discussion about the various signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in creation. And we can categorize these signs into two groups. In fact, there's, there's another verse in the Quran where Allah says, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ We will show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves. So these six verses that we're looking at, we can place them in one of two categories. Either they are signs within the creation of man, within man himself, or they are external signs. And one verse in particular seems to combine the two. So if we, if we go back for a second to verse number 20, where we began with uh, the verse about that's often cited in the context of marriage. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُكُمْ مِنْ and then in the next verse, so that that so verse number twenty is a verse that relates to the signs within man's own creation. The next verse, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا. So these are the internal signs, signs that are within the creation of man. Then in verse number twenty-two we see a combination. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ An external sign of God's existence, His oneness, His omnipotence, His wisdom, His mercy. وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ The variation in your tongues and in your colors. So this is what? This is an internal sign. This is a sign related to the creation of the human being. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِلْعَالِمِينَ And then as we go on, you know, verse 23, verse 24, verse 25, they're going to be related uh, to the external signs. Allah is going to speak about day and night and the procurement of sustenance. He's going to speak about, about lightning and, uh, and so on and so forth. So going back to verse number 22. So again, verses 20 to 25 are an examination of the divine signs in creation. And they are of two types. Internal signs related directly to the creation of man, and then the external signs, which are observable in the horizons, in the things that are external to us. Now, verse number 22, Allah says, and among his signs are the creation of the heavens and the earth. Now, we know that the universe came into existence. It was something that came into existence approximately 15 to 20 billion years ago. It's something that didn't exist, and now it exists. And this is a sign that there must have been a force, a creator that brought it into being, because it is preposterous 
to assert that the universe came into existence from nothing or it created itself. So we really only have three, ex three options. The universe exists. We know that it didn't exist at one point. Either, either it created itself, which is illogical, which is impossible because it didn't exist for it to create itself. Or it sprung into being from nothing. And that is also a logical impossibility. So the only logical explanation is that it was brought into being by something that eternally exists. So um, and among his signs are the creation of the heavens and the earth. It's a sign of his existence, number one, because it didn't exist. And then, lo and behold, it came into being. It's a sign, the creation of the heavens and the earth is also a sign of his oneness. Because no matter where you go, no matter where you journey in the universe, the same laws of physics apply uniformly throughout the cosmos. So there is, there is a unity that exists in creation. All matter is made up of atoms. All living things are made up of cells. So there is a, there is a, a unity, a uniformity that is seen in the universe that everything is made of the same stuff. So it's a sign of his oneness. The creation of the heavens and the earth is also a sign of his power. It's a sign of his qudra. That the being that brought this vast universe into existence necessarily must be an all-powerful being. It's a sign of his wisdom. We don't see a haphazard, disjointed system. We see a complex, a profoundly complex and sophisticated and orderly system. It's a sign of his wisdom. It's a sign of his mercy. So when the verse says, and among his signs are the creation of the heavens and the earth, it, it, it implies all of these things, his existence, his oneness, his mercy his knowledge. And in addition to the creation of the, the heavens and the earth, so that was a general statement. Now, Allah then is going to speak about something specifically related to human beings. The, the sheer diversity of tongues, meaning, you know, one, one interpretation is that the different languages that, that human beings speak is a testament to God's power, his knowledge, that he gave us the cognitive ability to produce and create language. And, you know, this is something that we take for granted. If you study language, just the, the brain activity that needs to take place, for us to speak is something that is, is astounding. The complexity of, of speech production is a testament to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdom and his power. You know, we, when we create robots, when we design robots, artificial intelligence, for, for an artificially intelligent robot to exist, it has to be programmed by an intelligent programmer. So when human beings speak, this ability of expression is, is one of the great signs of, of God's existence. You know, in Surah Ar-Rahman, what does Allah say? Ar-Rahman al Quran khalaq al-insan allamahu al-bayan. We're able to to take our thoughts and our, and our ideas and articulate them through speech. We're, able to, we're not only able to think, but we're able to translate that thinking process into language. And there's not only one language. This human mind has been able to create different languages, different modes of expression. 
This is a sign of Allah's power. That look at the sophistication of this creature that, that he brought into being. He gave this creature the ability to express itself. The variation in your color, you know, unfortunately, the difference in our color has been used throughout human history to discriminate. It's, it's become the focal point of racism, discrimination. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that your diversity the human diversity that exists, I did not create you in different shapes, in different colors, in different languages for you to discriminate against one in one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you recall in Surah Al-Hujurat, He explains why He created us differently. Why He created this diversity. Why didn't He just create one, one physical form and just replicate you know, that one skin tone or, the, or, the, or that he create, why didn't he just create a certain set of facial features and just replicate it? Why, why the diversity? In Surah Al-Hujurat, if you recall, Allah says, Ya ayyuhan nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakran wa unfa. O human beings, O people, we created you from one male and one female. So, Right off the bat, you need to understand that you come from a common origin. You shouldn't denigrate each other. You shouldn't abuse each other. You should treat each other with respect, with reverence, because you come from the same male and female. You're, you're, you are part of this global family. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرًا وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُ And we made you into tribes and nations and different cultures so that you may recognize one another. If you and I and every single person on earth had the same skin tone, we had the same shape eyes, the same eye color, we spoke the same, if there was no difference between us, we wouldn't be able to distinguish one person from another, you wouldn't be able to differentiate between who is your father and who is your neighbor, who is your mother and who is your sister. If we all look the same, we wouldn't be able to function. We wouldn't be able to differentiate one person from another. So Allah says, I made you into nations and tribes لتعارفوا, so that you can recognize one another, so that you can know that this person is unique from that person. If we all had the same color and we spoke the same and we looked the same, human activities would become disrupted. We wouldn't be able to function. So that's the literal interpretation of the verse. Now, some, some scholars who have more of a mystical inclination, they say that, and of course, I'm not, I'm just sharing with you some of the the interpretations. I'm not by any means saying that this is the meaning of the verse, but it's good for us to be familiar with, with some of the, the different interpretations that are out there. Now, some mystics, they look at this verse through a different lens. They look at it beyond its, its literal implications. They say, اختلاف, the variation in tongues and in color can be a reference to, you know, with respect to color, it could be a reference to the different states and the different conditions of human beings. You know, we, we even use color to describe temperament, human temperament. So for example, or human emotion. So for example, if we say that, you know, when someone is sad, at least in the English language, we say they have the, the blues. You have the blues means what? That you're sad, you're sorrowful, you're depressed. If, if we say that, you know, he's, uh, this person is red. He's red with anger. Red is a very fiery emotion. So 
in many in many languages in many cultures the different colorings are associated with temperaments with different states different conditions so some mystics have said that variation can also be seen as a reference so when 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 the verse speaks about the different tongues it could be a speaking about the variation in which people see and understand god's signs you know there's one there's one uh, mystic who's who's very controversial but i just want to share with you uh a statement uh, from him where he says the divine signs are in the, the divine signs the ayat that are within the quran have come in great variation because of their variation those who, who are addressed by them have a variety of descriptions so for example when you look at the quran for example if you go to surah ar-ra'd Surah 13, verse number 3. The end of the verse says what? إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ In, the, in that, there, these are signs. There are signs for those who reflect. So there are certain ayat that are that have more of, a, an, of an effect on certain people. You know, human beings differ in the way that they learn, in the way that they process information. There are some people that are better visual learners. So there's a certain way that you speak, that you educate visual learners. You use images, you use pictures, you use graphs, diagrams. There are some who are able to think more abstractly. There's a different way that you communicate with those types of people. There are people who, who are good listeners, they're, they're better, they're not strong when it comes to visual learning, but they're very keen and attentive listeners. There are those who, who are more emotionally inclined. People are different. There are some people that are very good at problem solving and connecting dots. And the Quran recognizes this. And therefore you find that throughout the Quran, when Allah says, you know, inna fi dhalika la ayatin, you know, in this, there are signs. There's often a, a description that these are signs for this particular group. In Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 164, at the end of the verse, it ends with, يعقلون. These are signs for people who understand. يعقلون literally means those who are able to tie things together. Surah 45, verse 3. These are ayat li ayatin la ayatin lil mu'minin. These are signs for those who believe, who have iman. In, earlier in the verse, so at the end of this verse, in the fidalika la ayatin lil alimin, these are signs for people with knowledge. Surah 10, ayah number 6. Allah says, لا آيات لقوم يتقون. These are signs for people who have taqwa. So if you don't have taqwa, you're not going to fully appreciate the sign that is being spoken of. Surah 20, verse 54. إن إن في ذلك لا آيات لأول النهى. These are signs for those who possess intellect. And then Allah, for example, in Surah Ali Imran, verse 13, in fi dhalika la'ibratan li ulil absar, for those who have, there are signs for those who have insight. So at seven o'clock every day, they have the uh, they're ringing to express their appreciation to, to health professionals. So I'll just wait uh, until the ringing ends. You know, as the ringing is going on, just as a side comment, you see it's it's in our fitrah. Even if you're not Muslim, even if you don't believe in God, it's in the human, it's in our natural disposition to express gratitude when you see that someone is doing, perform, performing an act of service. That when you recognize a ni'mah, 
human beings express gratitude. And therefore, when you recognize that everything is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that it's part of your fitrah to want to express gratitude to him. So when the Quran says, you know, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ That the variation in your tongues and in your colors is one of the signs of God. If we take it, if we understand it through this, through this mystical interpretation that one of the signs of God is also that he created us differently and we have we learn differently this variation in tongues and in colors is is an expression of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creative power that not only has created us differently in our physical forms but even in our temperaments and even in the ways that we process information in fi dhalika la ayatin lil alamin so throughout the quran you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks about signs, he often mentions who these signs are intended for. And, and the idea, I mean, the goal is to become, to possess all of these qualities, to be a person of knowledge, a person of reflection, a person of insight, a person of taqwa. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to, to different people, different groups. So there is an ayah for every, every group. If they if they open up their hearts to uh, to the divine message, verse number twenty three. Wa min ayatihi yasmaun. And among his signs is your sleep by night and day and you're seeking his bounty, truly in that are signs for a people who hear. In this verse, again, we've moved, we've moved to a discussion on, on sleep and the procurement of sustenance as one of the signs of God. And among his signs is your sleep by night and day. Now, sleep is often associated with night. Nighttime is the optimal period in the day to rest, to sleep. But here Allah says your sleep by day and by night. So why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak of sleeping in the day? Now, yes, the best time to sleep is at night. In fact, physiologically, there are certain, there are certain hormones that are only released by the body when it's dark at night. So this is what is optimal. However, we know that sometimes for whatever reason, circumstances, because of circumstances, we must sleep during the day. There are certain times where your circumstances do not allow you to sleep during the night, so you end up having to sleep during the day. There are people who work night shift, sometimes you're traveling, sometimes you're sick, sometimes you might have a, a, a newborn who wakes you up in the middle of the night and you have to compensate for some sleep during the day. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has built within, he's built in an incredible ability for us to adapt and adjust. Can you imagine if Allah created us in a way where we can only sleep when it's dark and when the sun comes out, it's impossible. Can you imagine what a nightmare it would be for us if our bodies just did not sleep unless it was dark? unless it was nighttime. So the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has created this adaptability within us, that yes, it's best to sleep at night. But if, if necessary, we can also sleep 
during the day. So this is one of the blessings of Allah, that this, this adaptability that we can adjust uh, because of our circumstances. Now, when it comes to sleep, sleep is really one of the mysteries of, of, uh, of the human experience. Scientists have done so much research about this phenomenon of sleep that we've really, even until today, we've just been barely able to scrape the surface about what happens to the human being, what happens in the brain when we sleep, when we dream. Now, from an Islamic perspective, we know that human beings have bodies and they have souls. In fact, as I've said before, we are essentially souls. We have bodies. So what we have is a body because our our primary identity is the soul. Now, when it comes to sleep, there is a, there's an interesting conversation between Imam al-Sadiq, uh, between uh, Imam al-Baqir and, and an individual who asked him about, uh, about death. So this person asks Imam al-Baqir, Ya ibn Rasulillah, mal maut? What is death? What is the reality of this, this inevitable thing that we have to experience called death? The Imam, he, he says, he explains death using sleep. He says, huwa fi kulli laylatin illa annahu tawilun muddatun. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he says, death is that sleep which comes to you every night except that it is more extended, it is longer. Now what happens when we sleep from a spiritual perspective? There is a, a question that Abu Basir, Abu Basir was one of the students of our fifth and our sixth Imam. He asks the Imam about the relation, the relationship between the body and the soul during sleep. So the narration says, so Abu Basir asks Imam al-Sadiq about the soul, the ruh, the spirit, at the time of sleeping, when we sleep. Is it, does it depart the body is, he says, min al -badan. Does the ruh depart the body when we sleep? Because our imams speak about sleep as a lesser type of death. Imam al-Sadiq he says, لا يا أبا بصير. He says, no, the, the ruh does not depart the body when we sleep. فَإِنَّ الرُّوحَ إِذَا فَارَقَتِ الْبَدَنَ لَمْ تَعُدْ إِلَيْهِ Imam al-Sadiq, he explains to Abu Basir that if the ruh, if the ruh departs the body, it would never return. It's kind of like if there is a bird that's in a cage and you open that cage, the bird cage, the bird is going to fly and it's not going to come back because you've liberated it. Why would it come back to this little prison? So the Imam says, no, the ruh does not depart the body. So what happens? The Imam says, غَيْرَ أَنَّهَا بِمَنْزِلَةِ عَيْنِ الشَّمْسِ مَرْكُوزَةٌ فِي السَّمَاءِ فِي كَبِدِعَا وَشُعَاؤُهَا فِي الدُّنْيَا The Imam says it's very similar to the example of the sun. It is fixed in its position in the sky, but its rays extend to the earth. So the Imam is trying to say that the ruh is not something that is physical, that it just exits the body, but rather it's something that extends. When the body sleeps, the body is deactivated. When the body is deactivated to, to a, a certain extent, 
the soul, the ruh, becomes more, it, be, it becomes strengthened by the de, through the deactivation of the body. So it it it's it's basically regains some of its potency. And that's why it's able to, that, I mean, that's the, re, the reason why you have dreams. The ruh starts to travel and move and witness things in the different realms. So when it comes to sleep, sleep is one of the ayat because it's a powerful reminder of, of death in, in, in a way. You know, because there's a beautiful narration from Luqman where he speaks about some of the things, the signs, the ayat that we should think about when we, when we consider sleep. It's an activity that, that we perform every day. We sleep every day. But do we reflect on what is happening to us when we sleep and when we wake up? Luqman, he says, Ya Bunay, in taku fi shakkim min al Luqman says to his son, Oh my son, if you are in doubt about death, if you have doubt about death, the fact that you will die, if you have doubt about this reality, then try to avert yourself from falling asleep and you will never be able to. No matter how strong you are, no matter how healthy you are, eventually sleep will overtake you. It's that, you know, that gentle tyrant that will just overcome you. You can't, you can't withstand it. You cannot, re you cannot repel it. It will overcome you. Luqman says, if you have doubt about death, then try to avert yourself from sleeping. You will never be able to. This is a sign. In the same way that we, we cannot, that we all sleep. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. And Allah makes us sleep every day. Sleep is this lesser death. So in the same way that we can't escape sleep, we cannot escape death. Now when we sleep, we, we usually wake up. وَإِن كُنْتَ فِي شَكٍ مِنَ الْبَعْثِ O oh my son, if you have doubt about Qiyamah, if you doubt that it's going to happen, فَرْفَعَ نَفْسِكَ الْإِنْتِبَاهِ وَلَنْ تَسْتَطِعَ ذَلِكَ If you doubt resurrection, then try to keep yourself from waking up from that sleep. You know, yeah, you might sleep for 10 hours, 12 hours. Maybe if you're a teenager, you can sleep for 15 hours. But eventually, you're naturally going to wake up. You're going to wake up. Luqman says, in the same way that you cannot avert wakefulness, you cannot avert resurrection cannot be averted. It's inevitable. Your death is inevitable and awaking from death is inevitable. In the same way that sleeping is inevitable and rising from your sleep is inevitable. This is a sign. These are things for us to reflect on. Now, going back to the verse, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ مَنَامُكُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ So, going back to this idea of sleep, whether it's in the day or the night. So, there are three levels of connection between the soul and the body. At any given moment, your, the soul is going to have one of the following connections to the body. Either there is total connection between the body and the soul, and that is when you are alive and when you are awake. When you're alive and you're awake, there is total connection between the ruh and the bedan, and the body, the spirit and the body. When you are alive and you are asleep, the connection is partial because the, the, the rays, if I want to use the, the words of the imam, there is a type of projection that is taking place. 
Partial connection is when you're alive, but you're asleep. And there will come a day when there is no more connection between the body and the spirit and the ruh. And that is when you die. That is when there is no connection between this physical body and the, the soul. If you go to Surah 39, verse 42, Allah says, Allahu yatawaffa anfusahina mawtiha. Allah causes the souls, He causes the souls to die. He causes this total separation between body and soul at the time of death. As for the souls that don't die in its sleep. So imagine two people go to sleep. One dies in the sleep, in their sleep. The soul that has, has experiencing this kind of emanation, Allah withholds it. It doesn't go back to the body. Allah sends back the soul to the body which he has decreed will continue to live for an extended period. So you see that even according to this verse, there is, there is a, it's a type of death that we experience when we sleep. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ مَنَامُكُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارُ وَابْتِغَاءُكُمْ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ And among his signs is your sleep by night and day and you're seeking his bounty. The fact that you are able to procure your sustenance is a sign of God. It's an ayah, it's a ni'mah that we should appreciate. You know, not every creature has been given this ability. We are able to seek out our sustenance. There are many creatures that don't have this. There's, the sustenance has to seek them. You know, you'll, you think of you know, plants and trees. They're not able to move and gather their rizq. They have to wait for the, the rain to descend, for the sun to shine. So Allah says that the fact that you are able to procure your sustenance, this is one of the ayat that he has given you this ability, this energy to gather your sustenance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has secured sustenance for those who seek it, for the creatures that must seek it, and the creatures that receive it without needing to seek it. Allah says in ayah number six of Surah Hud, "Wama min dabbatin fil ard illa ala Allahi rizqa." There is not a single creature on earth, but upon Allah is its sustenance. Now, whether that sustenance is delivered, that's a different story. You know, sometimes we block rizq from reaching other creatures. We commit acts of dhul. But Allah has created enough sustenance on earth to support all living things. So, and among his signs is your sleep night by night and day and you're seeking his bounty. Truly in that are signs for a people who hear. The next verse. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ يُرِيكُمُ الْبَرْقَ خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا وَيُنَزِّلُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَيُحْيِي بِهِ الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمِ يَعْقِلُونَ And among his signs is that he shows you lightning arousing fear and hope. And that he sends down water from the sky, then revives through it the earth after its death. Truly in that are signs for people who understand. So obviously this verse is speaking about the, the external signs. So some of the verses were ayat related to man and the condition of man. 
Now, these are signs that are external, that are in the horizons. And among them is lightning is mentioned. One of the ayat of Allah is lightning. And Allah says, Lightning arouses fear and it arouses hope. Now, what does this mean? Now, obviously, we know that lightning is frightening. It arouses the emotion of fear because when we see lightning, we fear it's the destructive force that it brings. You know, lightning sometimes can cause fires. It can, you know, sometimes people get hit light by lightning. So it's it can be a very destructive force. You know, it's it's accompanied by a thunderstorm. So it can bring about a lot of devastation. But that same sign, you know, subhanAllah, how one ayah can be a punishment, it can be a source of destruction, and it can also be a source of life. You know, and if you think about it, the Qur'an is very similar. The Qur'an, for those who have pure hearts, is a source of life. It's a source of guidance. But if the hearts are blind, if the hearts are polluted and they are corrupted, the same Qur'an will cause someone to deviate. It becomes a source of deviation. Many things are like this. Money. Money can be a blessing or it can be a punishment. Strength. It could be a ni'mah and it can be a niqma. Beauty. Is beauty a blessing? It depends. It could be a blessing of Allah Azza wa Jal, or, or you can use it to break the divine commandments. You can use it for haram. So you have someone like Yusuf alayhi salam. His beauty is a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For others, they use their beauty to disobey Allah. So one sign can serve two functions. It can be a source of punishment and it can be a source of Life can be a source of guidance, a source of hope and prosperity. So lightning, on the one hand, arouses fear. And it also arouses hope. Now, why does it arouse hope? Now, of course, in the past, people, they used to associate lightning with sun, thunderstorms and rainfall. You know, especially if you're a farmer, you know, you depend on these rainstorms. You depend on the water that uh, these storms bring for you to grow your crops. But beyond that, we know with the advent of modern science, we know that lightning actually has many benefits to the earth. Lightning benefits the earth in many ways that people 14 centuries ago didn't understand. It benefits the earth in ways that we didn't even understand a few generations ago. So lightning, for example, it helps maintain the, the electric balance between the atmosphere and the earth. So the earth is generally negatively charged and the atmosphere is positively charged. And there is a steady flow of, of ne negative, a negative current that comes from the, the earth. So the earth is constantly losing electrons. It's losing its, uh, its negative charge. So Lightning functions as a way, it helps recharge the earth to maintain that, that, the, that electric balance between the atmosphere and the earth. So lightning helps transfer the, the negative charge back into the earth because it's constantly emitting uh, this negative charge. The lightning also helps produce it helps ozone producing chemicals it helps create ozone producing chemicals so lightning 
helps preserve the ozone layer. It protects us from, you know, the, the UV, the UV light. It protects us from meteorites. It helps fortify the ozone layer. Lightning also helps. So in addition to the rain, it also helps fertilize plants. It adds, it adds nitrogen to the, to the soil. And of course, for more information, you can find, you can look in, uh, you can look it up online, but you see here how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he shows us lightning and this lightning arouses fear and it arouses hope. And this is how our relationship with Allah, this is how our relationship with Allah should be. Meaning that our relationship with Allah should be based on fear and hope. Al-khawf wa raja that the heart of a mu'min is between fear and hope. Now, what does that mean? What it means is that you should not be so, afraid, so fearful of God. You should not be so fearful of disobeying Him that you think to yourself that if I commit one sin, I'm doomed. And for sure God is going to punish me. No, you shouldn't. You should balance that fear with hope. So it's wrong to say that I am so fearful of God that if I slip, that's it, I'm doomed. That's excessive. Nor should you be so hopeful that you say, Allah is merciful. I, if, even if I commit the, the sins of the world, if I commit every sin, Allah will forgive me. So you shouldn't say, for sure Allah will forgive you. Nor should you say, for sure Allah will punish me. You need to be in the middle. You have, and this is this is where the human being becomes humble. You you are fearful of God, so you don't disobey Him. If you disobey Him, you do not fall in despair. There's that the element of of hope. Al khawf wa raja. Wa min ayatihi yurikum al barqa khawfan wa tamaa wa yunazil min al sama imaan. And then He sends down rain from the sky. Now, of course, rain doesn't come from, it comes from the clouds. But because clouds are in the sky, the sky is mentioned. And this is another sign of God. It's a sign of God's power. It's a sign of Allah's power. Do you know how difficult it is to transport water? You know, there are companies, you know, for example, there are certain uh, companies that, you know, they... They sell water in bottles. They have to fly the bottles, you know, on airplanes to deliver it to other parts of the world through ships. They have to put them on semi trucks to move them from one part of a country to another. It's expensive. You need a lot of labor. It's a huge cost associated with transporting water. And there are companies that have to think about logistics you know how to distribute you know you know companies like nestle like you know whatever other companies are there that sell water fiji water companies they they bottle the water in their facilities and then they have to distribute it distribution is very costly and these are companies that are run by intelligent people that the distribution of this water obviously it has to be it has to be managed by an intelligent company but why is it that the the transportation of the transport of water that happens in the skies that doesn't have an engineer there's no intelligence that is managing that and look at the way a lot transports water from from one region of the earth to another does allah send down semi trucks to deliver the water he delivers it through clouds. Through clouds. Clouds are the, the transporters of this water. So Allah moves it. And you're talking about millions of tons of water. And they don't, the, the water doesn't just fall like a waterfall and destroys you know, the cities and the villages. It falls in droplets. 
So Allah moves the clouds, transports the water, and then the clouds disappear. Allah even makes the vehicle disappear. So, so if, if you study the water cycle, believe me, even if you bring the best engineer, they cannot devise a more efficient way of transporting water around the world for zero cost. And using the most eco-friendly, the most eco-friendly delivery system. Companies today, they deliver water using ships and, and trucks and it pollutes the environment. Allah moves water throughout the world without destroying the environment. Isn't this the sign of a supremely intelligent designer, a maker? These are signs of Allah. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ يُرِيكُمُ الْبَرْقَ خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا وَيُنَزِّلُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً So not only does this water fall on the earth, not only does it sustain life, it brings dead vegetation back to life. You know, it's one thing to sustain something that's already alive. But Allah revives the earth after it has died. And time and time again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this as a visual argument for his ability to resurrect human beings. Allah is showing us that I have, don't doubt my ability to bring you back because before your eyes, every day, every season, I show you that I bring the dead back to life. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمِ يَعْقِلُونَ Truly in that are signs for people who understand. Verse number 25. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ وَالْأَرْضُ بِأَمْرِهِ ثُمَّ إِذَا دَعَاكُمْ دَعْوَةً مِّنَ الْأَرْضِ إِذَا أَنْتُمْ تَخْرُجُونَ And among his signs is that the sky and the earth stand fast by his command. Then when he calls you forth from the earth with a single call, behold, you will come forth. If you go back to verse number 20, we began with, or if you go back to verse number 22, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And among his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth. Now here in verse number 25, it's not a, it's not a repetition of that verse. Here Allah is not speaking about the fact that the creation of the heavens and the earth is, is one, of the, uh, one of his signs. Here what is being pointed to is not Allah's quality of al-khalik. So he brought the universe into existence, which is a sign of his power, his omnipotence, his wisdom. But not only does he bring it into existence, but he maintains it. And those are two different things. You know, even in, in our human affairs, there's a difference between constructing a building and maintaining it. Construction is a one-time thing. You built, you built a skyscraper. But what needs to happen after that is maintenance. Who's going to maintain this building? The operating cost, the work that goes into maintaining a structure. So Allah says, and among his signs is that the sky. So here, sama could mean the atmosphere or sama dunya, the, the lower heaven and the earth. Among his signs is that that the sky and the earth stand firm by his command. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not only Al-Khaliq, he is Al-Qayyum. Al-Hayyu Al-Qayyum, he is the live, he is the one who maintains the universe. He keeps everything in existence. The universe is functioning because of his command. So Allah didn't just create and that's it. No, 
he creates and he's actively sustaining every creature, every atom by his command. So in Surah Yasin, verse 82, Allah says, إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا أَنْ يَقُولَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ When Allah, indeed, His command, when He wills something, is that He says, be and it is. Sometimes Allah wills for something to come into existence, and other times Allah wills something to continue to exist. So here, one of His signs is that He maintains the universe. So creation doesn't only need Allah to come into being. So it's not that we, we only needed Allah to come into existence and then after we exist, we have a sort of independence. We are constantly at every moment in need of Him to maintain us, to sustain us. Because we don't exist in and of ourselves. Existence is bestowed upon us at every single moment. And this is what it means when Allah says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِ أَن تَقُومَ السَّمَاءُ وَالْأَرْضُ بِأَمْرِهِ That the sky and the earth stand fast by His command. He is sustaining it. ثُمَّ إِذَا دَعَاكُمْ دَعْوَةً مِنَ الْأَرْضِ إِذَا أَنْتُمْ تَخْرُجُونَ in the same way that he sustains everything by a single command, be and it is, exist and it is, he maintains everything by this amr. Similarly, we are resurrected by that single command. Da'wah means a single call. Allah doesn't have to repeat himself. You know, we were, I was watching the the news a few days ago and so many governors and state officials they're complaining that they constantly have to remind people they have to give numerous commands repetitive orders for people to to practice social distancing they have to constantly command and order for people to get the point for people to obey does Allah need to repeat a command for people to obey in the same way you came into existence without any choice, Allah says that you will come out of your graves with a single call. With a single call. So just as they, just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with a single command, He will resurrect us with a single command. It all comes first full circle. We came into being through His Amr, through His command, and we will be resurrected through his command. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Ajjal fajr. Any questions or comments? Um, so, so this attribute of Allah keeping everything in existence, uh, would that be related to the attribute of Rububiya or something different? Ahsan, ahsan. So, so this is this is really about Tawheed al-Rububiya, that He is the only one who maintains and sustains. So one of the meanings of when we say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, that praise be to Allah, the Lord. And the word Lord doesn't really do justice to the word Rabb. That He is Rabbil Alameen, that He is the sustainer, the maintainer, the cherisher of, of, uh, of the worlds, of everything in creation. So yeah, so this verse is really highlighting Allah's attribute of Rububiyya. And it's something that we need to think about. So yeah, so the universe came into being, but what is keeping it? What is allowing it to function? Now, someone might say, "Oh, it's the law, you know, the laws of physics." But where do those laws come from? Why are those laws fine-tuned the way that they are? Why do they exist? So, 
so yeah, so this is, so Rububiyya is, is uh, uh, it, it implies uh, that he maintains and he sustains. Uh, th thank you. And um, for the part where the heart of the moment should be between fear and hope, is, is it, it sounds like uh, it's saying that you should always be in a state of doubt. Is that the correct word that would be used to describe it? Or Doubt as in you should not say with certainty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will never punish me or he's not going to, you know, uh, because you, you have to also doubt the fact that, you know, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your, did you repent properly? So I think, see, doubt has negative connotations. You know, being between fear and hope is, is really, I would say that instead of saying that a mu'min is always in a state of doubt, a mu'min is always in a state of humility that they don't find themselves deserving of Allah's mercy where they say, okay, for sure Allah is not going to punish me. Nor, nor do they say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is going to punish me and I, there's no hope. So it's more really of, of humbling yourself before Allah. Fearing Him because you know He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He has this absolute power that you should be afraid of defying Him. But you shouldn't lose hope in his mercy. You shouldn't feel that you are eternally damned because you, you committed this and that he will, he'll never accept my repentance. That, that, is, that is obviously uh, you know, a wrong attitude to have. But I don't know if I would describe it as doubt. Maybe. I just think doubt has, has, has negative connotations. And I think that what is the message of being between fear and hope is is not to be overly confident in your actions. Have more faith in Allah's generosity than in your own actions. Damn, I, I like the word, the humility. That, that one makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And uh, related to um, sleeping and, and the soul, uh, and, and death being the sleep that comes to you every night, um, how, how does this relate, uh, how death being like sleep, how does that relate to the azab of the grave if uh, you're supposed to be asleep? So, so even when we sleep, you know, we have sometimes bad dreams, you know, so sleep doesn't negate experience. You know, we feel things when we sleep in many, in many cases, our dreams feel as real as, you know, when we are, when we're awake. So adab al qabr, you know. So when we say that that uh, that de that sleep is a lesser death, we're not saying that you're unconscious in the sense that you're you're completely oblivious of any reality. That there there are certain experiences that are taking place, and of course, someone who's who's wicked is gonna is gonna is gonna experience a degree of torment. They're gonna suffer. And, so, and someone who is more pious is gonna is gonna enjoy certain degrees of uh, of bliss. But in Barzakh, of course, we you know in the same so in our dreams we have bodies, right? So you know you have dreams of yourself. You know you're walking in a garden, you're meeting people. You're what is that body that you have in your dream? It's not the physical body. It's a lighter body. It's it's a body that's suitable for the dream world, that dream realm. Barzakh is the same. You know, that's why some scholars have said that it's a, it's a, a jism latif. It's a light body that resembles the body that we had in dunya, but it's, it's lighter. It's more compatible with that world, with Adam al-Barzakh. Some say that it's a, it's a jism mithali. It's a, it's a, uh, the, it's the, the body of similitudes, meaning that it, it resembles the body of, that we had in our earthly life. So yeah, so going back to your question, describing death as a type of sleep does not negate adab al-qabr or the barzakhi experience because when you sleep, you have dreams and you experience things in your dreams. And, and there's a question about, does the do near-death death experiences have any relation to the separation of the soul and the body? So... It depends on what you mean by near-death experience. So, 
if by saying near death, it means that you almost die, then a lot of people had have near death experiences. But if you're talking about the, the, that this, the body and the soul have, have become disconnected, then, then it's impossible. As, as Imam al-Sadiq said, when the ruh departs the body, when that connection between the body and the, the soul is severed, you cannot come back. Of course, unless with the aid of an angel, you know, there are certain people like Raj'a, certain people have been brought back to life. Isa ibn Maryam, when he revives the dead, that's a miracle that someone who is was chosen by God, whether it's an angel who is commissioned with that, has to have, I mean, it's a certain power that you have to have to kind of break that barrier between alam dunya and alam al-barzakh, to reunite the body with the soul. That's something that's that requires divine support. But people who who had a near-death experience, it means that they came close to dying. Maybe they were unconscious. But if we mean by near-death experience that they fully died and then they came back, that's that's generally impossible. And for uh, the part about certain verses being meant for certain groups, uh, how would you relate that to uh, the first few verses of Surah Baqarah where it attributes the list attributes that the entire book is meant for? So which verse are we speaking about? The first three, four verses of Surah Baqarah where it so, says that... Yeah, yeah. So, so, so when Allah says, Yes. So, so this is a good question because if the Quran is sent to guide, say let's say non-Muslims, because before before the Quran is revealed, people need to be guided. And if it's guidance for muttaqin, now how do you develop taqwa? You know, taqwa is if if you understand taqwa as piety that comes after faith and after practicing faith, and it's it's illogical; it becomes circular. Here, some scholars have said that ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Muttaqeen here doesn't mean, it's not referring to the taqwa that is developed after faith. Taqwa in its literal sense means to exercise caution, meaning it refers to people who are moral, conscientious people. So this book is guidance for those who are morally conscientious. Taqwa in its in the sense that it's it's guidance for people who who take life seriously, who are looking for the truth and who have who are looking for, for purpose. They're looking to refine themselves. So this is a taqwa that, that comes before submission to the truth. It's, it's having certain qualities that make someone inclined. You know, someone who has humility, someone who wants to understand truth. So, so someone who has this taqwa, you know, I, I don't know what the, the right word is, you know, maybe conscientious, conscientious person, someone who's who's morally upright. So it's guidance for them. So here, hudan uh, lil-muttaqeen, we shouldn't think that muttaqeen is what Imam Ali is talking about in khutbat al-muttaqeen. No, that, he's speaking about the highest levels of taqwa that comes after faith. But there is, there is a taqwa that comes before faith. And that's why there are some people who accept Islam and some people who, who don't. What's the difference between the two? Those who accept Islam, there was something in their hearts. They had certain qualities that other people didn't have. It's this kind of moral taqwa. They, you know, they cared about the conditions of their hearts. They're, they cared about morality. They were people of integrity. So this taqwa is this type of integrity, this thirst for the truth that comes before submission to the truth. Like Abu Dhar. You know, there were many people who were living in Arabia. Why did Abu Dhar accept Islam? 
because Abu Dhar had a quality that other people didn't have. He never lied. He never lied. He had this love for the truth. So this is a type of taqwa that made him attracted to the message. It was guidance for people like him because they possessed certain qualities that made them much more likely to submit to the truth when the truth reaches them. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Oh, yes. Alaikum <laughs> Thank you very much for the amazing informative uh, proceeding. May Allah bless you all, inshallah. Allah bless you. Um, just a thought uh, crossed my mind, uh, Sheikh. I don't know whether this is question or this is just my input or this is just my doubt. When you were talking about uh, Tawheed, uh, you were explaining about Tawheed. Um, I thought of uh, Wahdatul Wujud and Wajibul Wujud. What is our taking uh, in the school of that So there are there's there's a difference of see when, when we say when we speak about wahdatul wujud the oneness of existence now to understand what this means and, and this scholars say that this has many different interpretations and some of them are blasphemous and some of them are the essence of tawhid so if wahdatul wujud, it literally means the oneness of existence. Now, if the understanding of this, if someone says wah, because there are different, there are different schools of thought. Wahdatul wujud, which which is what some philosophers uh, subscribe to, is the idea that the only thing, the oneness of existence, meaning that. The only thing that exists is Allah. So they don't make any differentiation between him and his creation. There is, there's no thuna'iya. So they say, for, so there, someone will say that Allah, Allah is everything. That Allah is my notebook. He is, because nothing exists but him. Now this is false. So we, we clearly believe that there's khaliq and there's makhluk. Now, so we believe that there are things that exist other than Allah, but they rely on Him for, for their existence. And they came into being through Him. Shaheed Mutahari, he says that the best, the idea that I subscribe to is, uh, is Wahdatul Mashhud which is the oneness of that which is witnessed. Meaning, even though we see multiplicity, we see kathra, it means that you look, even though there is multiplicity, there are many things, but in everything you see Allah. Meaning, you don't say that that thing is Allah, but rather that thing's origin is from Allah. It is maintained by Allah and it will return to Allah. So this requires a lot more uh, detail, but uh, there are certain understandings of wahdatul wujud that, that is kufr, it's shirk. And it's the idea that, that everything is God and my chair is God and there is nothing but God. This is false. But to believe that... So for, let's one final point that I want to make is one thing that is true is that existence, the meaning of existence, when it applies to us and Allah is the same. So when we say that I exist and Allah exists, wujud here means the same thing. But the difference between my existence and Allah's existence is that his existence is more powerful in, in the sense that he doesn't, require anything to bestow existence upon him and my existence is something that requires a giver meaning i need something needs to bestow existence upon me but as a concept 
existence is applied to me and Allah in the, as a concept, it's the same. So Allah exists and I exist. So wujud here, it means the same thing. So it, this requires an entire you know, lecture in and of itself. But just in, in a nutshell, I think what helps is what uh, Shaheed Mutahari mentioned that that what we mean is that the oneness of that which is witness. So even we, even though we see many things, we see different creations, we see Allah in everything because he is its creator, its sustainer, and ultimately everything will return to him. Thank you, Jazakallah, Sheikh. Inshallah. Inshallah, yeah, I mean, may, maybe if we finish uh, our discussion on uh, on this tafsir, maybe we'll just do one one session just looking at uh, Wahdatul Wujud and the different explanations to see which one of those uh, theories is most in line with uh, the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. Inshallah, maybe we can do a session on that. And also, um, there's Khalf al Nuzul and Khalf al Su'um. Yes, inshallah. I'll, we'll get to that, inshallah. Thank you very much, Sheikh. May Allah bless you. Keep bless me in your dua, inshallah, and please uh, stay safe and uh, and uh, pray for those who are, are sick. May Allah grant them shifa and please keep me and my family in your dua. Thank you very much, Sheikh.